morning, everyone. Uh, so yesterday, we started introducing uh, some of the early concepts in CAM 11. Uh, we started looking at doing unit conversions again, basically multiplying these unitary rates, setting up the units, top unit cancels bottom unit here. We worked our way up to doing naming of compounds. We looked at ionic compounds, which are combinations of metals and nonmetals. Uh, basically, electrons get transferred. The metals end up taking on a positive charge. Uh, the charges have to counterbalance with the negatives, uh, even though uh, ionic compounds end up forming this repeating structure uh, this uh, lattice structure here, uh, we basically indicate in our formula uh, the ratio that's uh, set apart by the compound. So uh, let me just do as a warm up here, just a little bit of practice naming, um, something that will definitely uh, help you in the long run here. So I'm going to give you a couple formulas here, Ca3N2, uh, let's do FePO4, uh, let's do NH4 uh, Chiku. So these are called chemical formulas because these ones here are the uh, symbol uh, representation uh, of these uh, chemicals. Whenever I give you the formulas, you want to see if you can write the IUPAC name, so the word name for these ones here. Or uh, vice versa here, if I uh, give you the word name, uh, let's go uh, manganese, uh, four sulfite, uh, let's do rubidium, uh, dichromate and uh, let's do one more uh, tungsten uh, six uh, carbonate so you do need to be comfortable going from the formulas to the word names or in this case here from the word names over to the formula I'd encourage you just to pause the video try it out for yourself and then when you come back we'll check our answers so uh, looking at this first one here, we have Ca3N2. So first thing I want to do is I want to recognize, so far we've just been dealing with ionic compounds, so these will all be ionic, but to guarantee that they're ionic, I want to make sure that this first one here is actually a metal. The metal always comes first. Great. Calcium is on the left-hand side of the table, so it's uh, a metal. In this case here, we have calcium. We have the element here, nitrogen, just elemental. Remember, we just changed the to IDE. So this one here would then be calcium uh, nitride. So calcium nitride, the metal comes first, and we change it into IDE. You notice that I don't need to worry about any numbers, no Roman numerals, no prefixes or anything. I can work out those numbers uh, myself with the charges. The Fe and the PO4 here. Iron, because it's in that transition metal section, I would imagine that the iron here should have multiple charges. Uh, this iron here actually is going to be counterbalancing one PO4 grouping. I didn't have a bracket there because I only had one of them. But just so that you can look it up a little bit easier here, PO4 actually stands for phosphate. This one here is a polyatomic on the back of your periodic table. This one here by itself comes with a negative 3 charge. I just need one iron to counterbalance that charge. So that means iron has to be using its 3. So iron 3 phosphate. We only need Roman numerals for the metal and only if the metal is more than one charge. Uh, most of our polyatomics are actually negative. You're going to find that list is actually quite long. I would definitely memorize here NH4+. Plus. Um, I'm not going to find it on the element side. Well, it's still a polyatomic, but this is probably the one only positive polyatomic we're going to do. This guy here actually has the ending ammonium as a common name. Notice the ending is IUM instead of ammonia. Ammonia is a common molecule. Ammonia is NH3. To be a polyatomic is actually ammonium then that means this chiku part of it has to actually be another polyatomic here. This chiku, if you actually look on the back side of the, um, your polyatomic chart here, uh, you're actually going to find either you call this one here ethanoate, so that's perfectly fine as a name. It sort of uses that organic chemistry, that sort of eth prefix. Um, more commonly, the common name for this ethanoate here is sort of ethanoate, uh, comma, acetate. So you can also call it acetate as well, so ammonium acetate. Uh, next one over here, careful for this uh, uh, fourth one here. Manganese is the element Mn. This is not magnesium. Magnesium is Mg. And in this case here, manganese being a transition metal, it has more than one charge. I'm actually telling you manganese is currently using its four. I actually help you a little bit. I'm telling you, oh, by the way, manganese is four. Uh, sulfide, this one ends in IDE, so probably going to be just elemental. This is sulfur. Sulfur is two columns away from noble gas, so that's negative two. What's the ratio between manganese with 4 and sulfide with 2? Well, I would need two sulfides to counterbalance the manganese's charge, so therefore I'm going to have MnS2. Rubidium dichromate here. Rubidium is a uh, alkali metal, so rubidium with a plus 1 charge. Dichromate, we're starting to see these prefixes, but remember, this prefix here isn't something that I added. 
In this case here, it's just a common name dichromate. Dichromate actually stands for Cr207-2. Uh, we are going to need two rubidiums here, so Rb2 and then Cr207, that's rubidium uh, dichromate. And then for the tungsten, although it has a really weird letter, uh, tungsten is actually W. Uh, w has a plus 6. In this case here, we want carbonate as an ATE ending. So I'm going to look at my polyatomic chart here. Carbonate is a grouping CO3 minus 2. I need three of these CO3s uh, to counterbalance the tungsten. Careful, it's going to be tungsten with CO3. It's not that 3 that I'm talking about. Carbonate by itself would already have a um, CO3. There's three oxygens. But I actually need a bracket, and I need to still tell you I need three of the whole carbonate grouping there. All right? So hopefully you were able to name those ionic compounds here with no trouble. Uh, let's just rehash over a little bit with naming of acids. Uh, in this course here, we're going to spend a whole chapter looking in, in more detail with acids and bases. Uh, so let's just practice a little bit of naming here. So naming of acids, and we'll work our way over to covalent compounds. Uh, as we start naming acids, it's important to realize which compounds are actually acids. Acids, by definition, uh, acids, let's see, I'm going to walk to my pen here. So acids, uh, they have to release an H plus in solution. So H sometimes has split personality here, but H being a positive, H is sort of acting as a meadow. Um, so usually for acids, I would recognize it to be H something. And for that something, I just use a place of HA. It could be HCl, it could be HBr, it could be H anything. Because it has to end up releasing an H, I would imagine that as an ionic compound, it already has an H. So that upon dropping into water, it ends up giving up the H+, and we're left over with uh, what other counterbalancing ion that we have. Uh, there's three categories of acids here. We have simple binary acids. So for a binary acid here, the general name is going to be hydro something ic acid. So let's go to, let's say, HCl. You would have called this one here hydrogen chloride, right? Metal comes first, non-metal comes afterwards. Because we recognize, wait, this one here is actually an acid. I want to change it to the acid name. I'm going to keep the hydro for the hydrogen. It's just going to be hydro. I need to indicate to you chlorine is the uh, counterbalancing one. This one here is now going to be called hydrochloric acid, right? What our stomachs use to actually digest food. So binary compounds are in that fashion. Uh, let's do HI. You would have called it hydrogen iodide. Because it's an acid, we're going to change the name here to hydroiodic acid. Pretty much, if you still have the hydro there, the counterbalancing one here is just an atomic species, just chlorine, it's just iodine here. When is it not binary is if we throw in those polyatomics again. For our polyatomics, the general endings, polyatomics could have ended in ATE or ITE in general. What we're going to do is we're going to drop the hydro in both these cases here. This one, we're going to just keep the ic acid. Well, how would I know that there's still going to be hydrogen? If you tell me that it's still an acid, I know it has to be able to release this hydrogen. So for example, let's take NO3 minus. NO3 minus here is nitrate. NO3 minus is not an acid. It doesn't have the H to give up. H has a positive charge. I would need one H to counterbalance that charge. Let's go HNO3. You would have called it hydrogen nitrate. But because this is the acid form here, we're going to drop the hydro altogether. In the word name, I'm going to call this one here just nitric acid. Change the ending to ic acid. It's still an acid, so I would indicate that it still has the proton. It still has the H. Uh, let's do one more here. Let's go SO4 minus 2 uh, for sulfate. Uh, this sign is a minus 2, so I would actually need to have two H's to counterbalance it, H2SO4. Uh, yes, I do want to change the ending ATE to ic acid. Uh, we just keep in one other syllable there, so we'll call this one here sulfuric acid, as opposed to just keep it as hydrogen sulfate. Uh, the last category for acids here, we have what if the acid is built off a of polyatomic that actually end off, ends off in ITE instead? For ITE, Again, we drop the hydro, we just change the ending to OUS acid. So um, let's do uh, nit nitrous. So nitrate was NO3. Nitrite is actually NO2 minus. Whenever we talk about covalent compound, they can bond in many different ratios. Coincidentally, easy for us, the charges are actually the same. This one here is actually nitrite. So if I had the acidified form of that, the protonated form, if it actually gets the H, this one here is going to be called hydrogen nitrite, or change the ending, nitrous acid. Uh, let's do our phosphate again, PO4 minus 3. So this one here is phosphite. 
how many H's would I need to fully counterbalance this charge? Well, every H is plus one, so I need H3, PO4. And in this case, uh, we're gonna, again, drop the hydro altogether, but we're gonna call it phosphor, phosphorus acid. Right, so H3PO4 there. So definitely naming of acids here. Acids are going to be sort of the opposite. They get neutralized by bases. Bases have a characteristic hydroxide grouping, uh, but there's no sort of fanciness in terms of the naming, so uh, we deal with it at that point. So especially if it is a uh, acid, uh, you'll hint at it if it sort of begins with a hydrogen, you want to convert over to the acid name. Don't just leave it as a regular ionic compound. Then to finish off our review of uh, ionic naming here, we took a look at what are called hydrates. Hydrates are things that contain water. Uh, they contain water. And basically, I think of a hydrate, first thing I want to indicate is a hydrate is a solid. So I think of it as a sponge. So let's take a sponge, it's currently dry. Let's soak it into a pool of water. So just toss the sponge inside. If you give the sponge a swish, Basically, there's so many pores, there's so many holes inside the sponge itself that can actually hold the water. When you take that sponge out of the water, the sponge is going to be much heavier because it's actually uh, attracted and held a lot of waters inside its structure. Right? It's still solid, but it's holding water between the gaps. In the chemistry context here, the sponge itself is my ionic compound. It's going to be this whole lattice structure of positives and negatives. Right? We end up doing this repeating pattern. Well, you notice what's left behind between the positives and negatives are all these little gaps here. Those gaps, like a sponge, are actually good enough to actually hold water inside. So in this one here, uh, the hydrate in the formula we might see as, let's say, CuSO4.5 water. Uh, this was that blue compound, the blue solution that we use in multiple labs here. The dry part, the dry is referred to as anhydrous. Anhydrous means without water. The dry part is ionic compound, just the lattice before it's actually absorbed all the water. You can call this part here copper 2 sulfate. Again, for sulfate F or pH there, it doesn't matter. But to indicate to you that this solid compound, right, it's important to emphasize it's still a powder. Usually, sometimes when you drop powders in water, it dissolves. No, this one here is still a powder. But as I lift this wet sponge out, it's ended up absorbed a bunch of waters inside. By ratio, for every one CSO4, it's absorbed five times the amount of water in its pores. We're actually going to use the prefaces to actually uh, indicate how many waters. So the prefix for five is going to be penta. I always get really strange endings afterwards. I get like uh, penta hydride, penta hydrogen, penta water. Just remember we're in the family of hydrates, so this is going to be penta hydrate. It's been hydrate hydrated five times. That's the only time I want to see prefaces in ionic compound. On that note here, let me just uh, rehash for you some of these prefaces. So let's just count to 10 here. 1 to 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And then what we're going to do, uh, 1 is mono, 2 is di, like a tricycle for 3, tetra, like a tetrahedral, penta we just did, uh, 6 is hexa, 7 is hepta, 8 is octa, 9 is nona, and 10 is deca. Again, on the junior science table, they were nice to you. They even gave you these prefaces here. Uh, hopefully, by now, you'd memorized uh, at least 1 through 10. Yes, in organic chemistry, we'd end up switching at 1 to 4. We end up doing like methyl, ethyl, propyl. We won't need to do that in this course here. So make sure you're comfortable with those prefaces here. Uh, one other type of compound, we spent um, a lot of review time here looking at ionic compounds. How about let's switch over to a covalent compound just briefly here. For a covalent compound, as opposed to being a metal and non-metal, a covalent compound is actually just non-metal and non-metal. So non-metals are on the right-hand side. Uh, there's only about 15, 16 of them here. Definitely not as many. However, the reason why we get so much complexity in a covalent compound, instead of electrons actually being transferred, we actually have, we're going to end up sharing electrons. And because we share electrons, we actually don't transfer an we don't actually transfer the electrons, there's actually no charges that end up forming. So that thing in ionic uh, compounds, so uh, the non-metal pulled so hard, it transferred the electron, it actually became a negative, and that's why we wanted to have lattices here. It doesn't happen for a covalent compound. A covalent compound here, usually we refer to, these are just individual molecules, or better yet here, we're going to call them here just, these are molecular. So if I have a covalent molecule here, let's do the covalent molecule, let's say CO2. So carbon is a non-metal, oxygen is a non-metal. Uh, we did the bonding back in uh, grade 11. I'm not going to worry too, too much about this. But because the carbon doesn't lose as badly to oxygen, 
even if this bond here is polar, even if the oxygen hogs the electrons a little bit, it's not enough to actually become a full negative to a carbon to become fully positive. In that case there, then therefore I'm not actually a lattice structure. We are just a simple molecule. We have exactly one carbon and two oxygens. Even if I somehow manage to solidify carbon dioxide, like dry ice, dry ice is actually not water, dry ice is solid carbon dioxide, basically it's just having a bunch of these CO2 blobs here. It looks like a lattice, it looks like it's repeating, but it's just temporarily, because in the solid form here they don't have much kinetic energy, they're just going to be vibrating in place, they're really closely tied together. Upon heating it, carbon dioxide actually sublimes, it actually jumps straight from solid into the gas state. And basically, when I separate this off, it's just going to be a CO2 blob. It's just going to be a CO2 blob. Right? And that's why we typically are gases room temperatures. Those really weak background attractions, those London forces, they don't really hold the CO2s with neighboring CO2s all that well. Uh, notice what's sort of tricky here is the CO2, to actually form it into a gas state here, I'm not actually destroying the CO2. You were CO2 as a solid state, you were CO2 as a gas state. The covalent bond still stays intact. When you actually vaporize this, when you actually boil it, all you're doing is you're just breaking these in-between forces. So just be careful, ionic and covalent are somewhat different. Uh, ionic compounds we're going to see in chapter 3, you dissolve them in water, they form electrically conducting solutions because of all those charges, whereas these ones here, because they had no charges to begin with, when you bubble them to water, you might get them soluble, but definitely it's not going to be conductive. So covalent compounds are molecular, they're going to end up being non-conductive, uh, for these ones, pretty much, you're going to have a prefix tell you exactly how many there are. While I would have said monocarbon uh, dioxide, we still need to change the any to IDE. So that's similar for both ionic and covalent. Uh, what IUPAC says is if this first one is a nonmetal, you can drop if it is a mono. But only for the first nonmetal, that's why we call this one here carbon dioxide. If this other one were, let's say, carbon monoxide here, I still need to keep this mono uh, there. So um, be careful, especially when you're starting to do the naming here. Uh, make sure uh, uh, to use the appropriate naming for the type of compound that we actually have. Let's switch over now and uh, rehash a little bit of the math that we did. So a lot of our uh, Chem 11 course uh, was looking at the mole as a concept. Uh, the mole actually became a base, uh, a base unit, an SI unit. It actually, it, think of it as a box. Inside this box here contains many, many particles. Uh, it was defined off of carbon. And basically, we had one mole of any quantity. It's actually 6.02 times 10 to the 23, what we refer to as Avogadro's number or Avogadro's constant. Definitely, it's a rounded number. So this one here would be, act like a three sig number. But basically think of this, while the chemicals we're talking about are so tiny, I don't have the time to stand at the store and start picking out one atom, two atom, three atom, four atom. They already are pre-boxed for you, and the boxes, they come to you in boxes of Avogadro's number. So just like when you go buy eggs at a store, uh, you're not standing there just grabbing one egg at a time because they've been pre-boxed into dozens. You just sort of count how many boxes, how many packages do you need. In this case here, the package is just uh, a lot bigger then. So this is one of our first uh, unit conversions here. One mole is always going to be an Avogadro number inside. And we'll practice with this uh, very shortly. Depending on the chemical that actually is sitting inside the box, we have to refer to another conversion called molar mass. It's essentially the mass of one mole. So let's write this down here. It's the mass, um, mass of one mole. And this one here comes from the periodic table, and it's going to be expressed in grams per mole. On the periodic table, all the numbers are actually relative units. It's actually best to say no units, but in this case here, because we're trying to do it in the unit conversion, we actually tacked on just a gram per mole. Uh, so for example, I gave you the hydrate from earlier. We had CUS4.5 water. I know this is a lattice, but for the formula unit, what you would do is you would just add up uh, all the masses that we have. So in this case here, we have the mass of copper. Uh, copper is 63.5. You know we don't need to show this work here. Uh, sulfur is 32.1. I have four oxygens, so four times oxygen weighing 16. And then what about this five water? Because the five waters are sitting in between the holes left behind by the lattice, I'm going to end up adding five mass of water. Well, H is two, uh, sorry, H is one, but there's two of them, so two, plus the 16 of um, oxygen. Water is actually 18. When you add those all up there, 63.5, at 32.1 plus 4 times 16 plus 5 times 18. This one here gives you a total uh, 249.6. 
in terms of our sig figs because our periodic table all has things in one decimal place. Make sure your final answer still has one decimal place. And now because the number has gotten significantly large, we now actually have a four sig fig number here. Uh, this unit, best to say no units, but especially for molar mass, we can think grams per mole. So this sticks with a G for every one box of this chemical. So we use that as our second conversion. Uh, we learned two other conversions here. Specifically for a gas at STP, we had a guy called molar volume. The molar volume is the volume or the space that's occupied. Uh, volume occupied by one mole. But there was two restrictions on this one here. One mole, it had to be at gas. So we're talking solids and liquids, don't even bother with this. And it had to be at something called STP. Gases basically they respond really quickly to how hot it is and how much pressure there is. We just chose one reference temperature. Let's choose zero degrees Celsius. And for pressure, we use one bar. In that case there, our molar volume conversion, we for the longest time said one mole was 22.4 for a slightly different standard pressure. For our new standard pressure here, we are now using 22.7. And we're going to use liters for that. So the nice thing about this one here is it doesn't matter the type of gas, as long as you're just one mole, as long as you're at these standard conditions, regardless of the chemical you are, one mole will always take up a space of 22.7. Uh, last conversion here we had was concentration. Also another sort of link to volume, but this one here, concentration actually describes for us the moles of solute, the moles of the thing that you're dissolving. Usually for us, the solute is going to be a solid. This is the thing that's going to be in lesser quantity. We divide it by our volume of solution. So it's like making orange juice. Uh, you can dilute it down as much as you want. Um, it will sort of factor into the color intensity. It will factor into the taste. But this one here is concentration. Looking at those units there, we're going to have a moles on top. We're going to put a liters on bottom. We're going to shorthand that with a capital M. And that capital M here, we just say in uh, words here, molar. So 5 molar, 10 molar. Right? It just defies how many moles uh, there are per every liter. Let me just summarize that uh, on that mind map that we saw. We started seeing that the mole was in the middle of these conversions here. Whenever you wanted to crack open the mole and actually figure out how many are inside, we use Avogadro's number. One mole is 6.02 times 10 to the 23. You had to be careful, especially with molecules and atoms. I'll do a quick practice question for you there. Uh, once you get back to moles here, you can start asking yourself, well, what chemical is actually inside? Can we get the molar mass from the periodic table here? So this one here is uh, the molar mass from the periodic table. Out of all the bits here, this will convert grams to moles. This will help you figure out how much mass to actually scoop out to actually um, get a certain uh, number of uh, atoms. Um, next one we did was going to molar volume. So for molar volume, only for a gas SCP, one mole is 22.7. So let's go this one here is volume. I want to specifically mention here, this volume is a gas at STP. And then we actually had one other bubble that other bubble in a similar fashion was also volume, but specifically those volumes here were actually for solutions, for dissolving solids and liquids. This time that conversion changes a lot. This time it's actually just going to be concentration is moles per volume. Right? So with that summary map here, let's just practice through. Uh, this will get us back into reviewing stoichiometry tomorrow. Uh, so let's just do as an example. I want to find how many hydrogen atoms in uh, 5.6 liters of methane. So that's the first question. And then I'll give you a solutions practice here. Uh, what mass of NiCO2 is needed to make 125 milliliters of 0 0.500 molar solution? Usually for solution, I just say L S O L N. So again, I would encourage you to pause the video, uh, try it out for yourself, make use of this mind map here, and then when you come back, you can check your answer with me here. So let's just start off here. We're given 5.6 liters. Liters, I know it to be a volume. The question here is, well, what's methane? First thing, methane is a common name. So methane is actually the common grouping here, CH4. Methane in our uh, regular everyday temperatures and pressures is actually a gas. So I actually want to go from uh, volume of gas, 5.6 liters of it, so a little bit over a milk carton, and I want to get up to actually how many atoms there are. So I'm starting over here at volume of gas, I want to work my way up to here. So I need to use the molar volume conversion, 22.7, and then I need to use Avogadro's number here. 
So let's try it. Question mark, how many hydrogen atoms? If you're ever stuck, just start off with the number given, 5.6 liters. Our first conversion is gonna get us from liters back to moles. Liters goes on bottom, moles on top. For every 22.7 liters, I have a box. And then I'm ready to use Avogadro's number. Now you need to be careful here. This time, methane by itself is a molecule. So imagine sitting inside this box here are a bunch of these CH4, 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 right? They're already blobs of CH4. Sure, one box, one mole is always an Avogadro number. But it's Avogadro number of what? Well, it's Avogadro number of the molecule that we have. So unfortunately, even though in the end I still want to get to atoms, unfortunately at this point here, I'm still at the point molecules. In this case here, I'm interested in going to each of these methane molecules and actually counting. For every one methane, I should count 1, 2, 3, 4 H's. 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 I'm not actually chemically destroying methane. I'm just asking you to count the H part in methane. So what we're going to do is we're going to tack on one last conversion. For every one molecule of methane, CH4, there should be four H atoms. Sometimes they say how many total atoms. There's five atoms total, four of which are H's. Numbers on top you multiply, on the bottom you divide. So we're going to go 5.6 times Avogadro times 4 divided by 22.7 gives me here 5.9 times 10 to the 23. Always do a mental check for yourself. I am expecting this to be a very big number because I have some, like, some volume, right? It's decent size here. And if I have a whole box, we're talking millions and millions of particles. Don't forget to put this times 10 to the 23. Uh, sometimes your calculator has this power uh, in the corner. Sometimes it even says 5.9 E23. Uh, when you write it down, just write it back in proper scientific notation. Next question here is a little bit harder. I'm interested in finding mass, so I'm interested in getting over here. And what I'm given is actually two numbers. Whenever we have solution problems, we're always given two. I always ask you, well, start off with the number that's easier to work with. In this case here, I would say, well, 125 milliliters, that's the volume. I'm starting over here. Seems easy enough. Then we have 0.5 molar. Uh oh, this molar actually is hiding inside it moles per liter. So that molar here is actually a conversion factor for us. Because that's a conversion factor, I'm going to use that for my concentration factor. So let's just try this out here. I'm interested in finding what mass of nickel chloride, how many grams of nickel chloride. The unit that's easier to work with here is the 125 milliliters. So I'm just going to convert this here. I know the molar stands for moles per liter. So 125 milliliters is going to be 0 0.125. You don't need to show me that conversion. Just 1,000 milliliters is in one liter. I'm going to multiply it by concentration. I want to get from liters to moles before we're tempted to do the 22.7 like earlier. In this case here, we're actually a solution. We're actually a mixture. So instead of using 22.4, I just want to figure out how strong the orange juice is this time. Well, the strength is for every one liter, it's actually 0 0.500 moles. That actually is the concentration. Those two units there were cancel. Liter cancels liter. I'm now back to moles, and now I can use my periodic table and get up to mass here. So we're going to just keep going here. We have one mole. Uh, I add up a nickel. Nickel is 58.7 plus twice a chlorine, 35.5. Remember, this twice chlorine here is not because it's diatomic. It's just from the ratio from the ionic compound. 0.125 times 0.5 times 129.7 gives me here 8.11. This calculation here is sort of asked in reverse because we know the target. I know I want to make about a half cup. I know how strong the orange juice should be tasting. How much powder should I start weighing out so that when I add up the volume here to uh, 125 milliliters, there's enough powder in there. Oh, I need 8.11 for this solution here. Uh, we did a sort of quick twist uh, in this mo section here into empirical and molecular formula. Not too much uh, in our uh, Chem 12 course, but just for practice here, uh, I want you to find the molecular formula, right? because a covalent compound here is just a simple uh, individual molecule. I want to know the exact numbers. Find the molecular formula uh, if a sample contains... Uh, let's say 54% carbon, that's a uh, percent composition, 36% uh, is oxygen, and we have 9% is hydrogen. Right. So this is getting us back into the empirical formula, a little bit of practice here. They have a sample that's in front of you. I don't necessarily know how much, because I know percent works really nicely with uh, 100. I'm going to assume my sample is actually going to be 100. 
because the second I'm 100 grams, if you say 54% of 100, well, I know right away that means 54 grams. And that's going to be grams of carbon, fine. Uh, the next one here is going to be 36 grams of oxygen. It may not be exactly separated for you sort of in different uh, areas, but just to keep things simple for myself, 36 grams. This one here is oxygen. Would I put O or would I put O2? Remember, O would actually be a diatomic if it's by itself. Even though I don't know what the formula is, this O is definitely not by itself. It's in a compound with C's and H's, so I just have the O there. Uh, for the 9% here, we have 9 grams of hydrogen. So uh, let's see how we do. So we have C, we have H, we have O. Right now, what's unfair is that they actually have different molar masses. So mass actually means something a little bit different uh, to each of these. So um, uh, 36 grams for oxygen, 9 grams for hydrogen. Uh, so first thing we're going to do is we're actually going to divide out the molar mass. They usually it's kind of confuse you here. This looks like molar again, but that M there actually just stands for the molar mass. So let's put them on a level playing field. Carbon weighs 12, hydrogen weighs 1, oxygen weighs 16. You'll notice I've just done the molar mass of 1. So 54 divided by 12 gives you 5.4. 9 divided by 1 is just 9. 36 divided by 16 gives me here 2.25. Now these are actually moles. I could actually say uh, C 4.5, H 9, O 2.25, but you know we want things to be simple. You want things to be whole numbers if we can. So what we're going to do is we're going to end up dividing out the smallest. What dividing out the smallest one does is it just scales the numbers down. In this case here, the smallest one is 2.25. Let's divide everything by 2.25. This should become a 1. Um, the other one's a 2, and the other one here is a 4. So if I preserve those ratios with these really ugly decimals here, uh, in this case here, it actually stands for C2H4O1. This one here is currently referred to as an empirical formula because this is the simplest uh, whole number ratio. So empirical formula, it's been simplified. Simplest whole number ratios in compound. Because this is covalent, however, because it's individual, it's possible that my compound may actually be double this or triple this. So one easy thing I can figure out uh, in terms of uh, how many of these do I have is actually looking at the mass. My empirical mass, if this really were my formula, and I went to the periodic table, I tried to do a molar mass, 2 times 12 plus 4 plus 16, we have a mass of 44. If you do another experiment and you test the real compound, so let's say this is also given here, uh, given the actual, they might call this one here a molecular mass, so the mass of your molecular formula, uh, given the actual formula is, let's make it 88 gram per mole. Then you say, well, how many Lego blocks that weigh 44? Oh, I need two of them. So therefore, my MF, my molecular formula, my actual compound may be double this, and it's then going to be C4H8O2. And there we go. That's just a slight twist on the sort of mole problem, uh, but just uh, practicing a little bit of empirical formula, molecular formula. We won't need too, too much uh, in our course, uh, but uh, definitely some good practice there. I'm going to end off my review for today uh, with just a quick look at reactions. Uh, then that will set us up nicely for tomorrow for stoichiometry. As we start looking at chemical reactions, this is, remember, we had our six simple types of reactions. Our three key words that we had was predict, balance, and classify. For the following uh, six types of reactions, uh, we can actually um, make some guesses. Well, if I have a certain amount of ingredients here, what are your products going to be? Uh, I'm going to do these for you. Uh, we're going to call this first one here a synthesis. A synthesis in general, we have A and B. When you synthesize something, they just combine together. They smush together. Um, you still need to check uh, the compound that you form make sure you've written it correctly. The opposite of a synthesis reaction here is a decomposition, when things break apart. So decomposition, really easy to recognize because we just have one chemical and then an arrow. The only thing this can do, it can't switch with things, it can't collide with things, it can fall apart. So this one is going to be A and B. Uh, we did a combustion reaction. Combustion is a fancy name for a burning reaction. For burning to occur, you actually need to have oxygen as a reactant. So what's going to happen is you're going to take whatever you're burning. This is usually going to be, so usually it's going to be CX, HY, OZ, some combination of those, right? Because the things that we're burning are going to be hydrocarbons or sugars, things like that. Three out of the four things are actually set. For a burning reaction, you have to react with oxygen. We always assume what's referred to as a complete combustion. 
So let's imagine that there is way enough oxygen, the fire has been raging around for a little while, it gets fully oxidized to end up forming CO2 and water. Right? So three out of the four things are fixed. I can burn uh, methane, CH4, I can burn ethane, uh, C2H6. Right? I can actually burn a whole bunch of things, but three out of the four things are actually fixed for you. If uh, later on I do say an incomplete combustion here, incomplete combustion, you'd end up forming Cs and COs as opposed to this complete case that we actually have CO2. Let's move on here to our replacement reactions here. We can have a single replacement reaction, also called a single displacement reaction. For a single replacement reaction here, as the name suggests, we have one person that's by themselves, an A, and basically if the reaction occurs, we had to check something called the activity series. We wanted to check who forms a stronger bond. What we found was if I am, so we're gonna fight metals against metals, non-metals against non-metals. If I'm higher up on the chart, I can kick off anyone lower than me. So if, for example, A is a metal, A is going to fight with B. If A is higher than B, A can kick off B no problem. In the compound, we still have to have a metal and a non-metal, so it's gonna be AC, poor old B end up get, getting kicked off. It's possible that for a single replacement, we actually have the non-metal switching in. It could be a non-metal trying to replace a non-metal. Um, so it would be uh, B with A, and then C would be kicked off. But basically, in general, one thing got kicked off. Uh, we're going to take a look at the last two types here. We have a double replacement reaction. Basically, it's a, a switching of partners here. We had done in Chem 11. We don't need to check the activity series because no matter how the combination ends up working out, we still end up with the ratios AD and CB like this. So they just switch partners. Make sure you still have a metal, non-metal, metal, non-metal. Non now no one is left alone. And we'll end off with a very special case of double placement here. We'll call this one here a neutralization. Uh, we'll do neutralizations a little bit more in Chapter 4 in Chem 12. Uh, for a neutralization, it essentially is a double placement reaction, but what's neutralizing is actually an acid and a base. We, in general, say it forms a salt and a water. This word here, salt, just means some general or generic ionic compound. Some leftover metal and non-metal. If you take a look at, well, an acid should have an H, HA, and a base should have an OH. Let's say B can be anything, lithium, sodium, whatever, with an OH. Well, they're just going to mix and match partners. Basically, the B is going to swap places with the hydrogen. We're going to end up with BA. That's going to be your ionic compound. Could be table salt. Very often, it's not. And we end up with oh, HOH, and HOH here is actually water, two H's and an O. So the reason why we always need to try to give water is because the acid's job is to give you an H+, plus, the base's job is to give you an OH-, minus. when these guys actually match up, these guys end up forming in a one-to-one -one ratio, forming water. Uh, let's just backtrack here for a double placement, just for practice here. There's a little bit more detail I can show you for a double placement. We'll see this detail a little bit more in chapter three. Let's say I was asked this question, I want you to uh, do the predicting, balancing, classifying for the following reaction. Uh, let's go calcium chloride reacting with sodium carbonate. All right. So again, the same three keywords here. We'll just do this for practice. Um, we can predict it. Well, this is metal, non-metal, metal, non-metal. Non right? This should be a double placement reaction. Upon a double placement reaction, we don't need to check the activity series. We're going to end up with the same compounds anyways. We're going to end up with calcium bonded with carbonate. We're going to end up with sodium bonded with chlorine. In general, these numbers don't drag over. right? We can work out the charges ourselves. So Ca has a plus 2, carbonate has a negative 2. That's perfect. Na has a plus 1, chlorine has a negative 1. That's perfect as well. But what about this 2? I have 2 chlorines and 2 sodiums. At the very end, we can add those coefficients to balance. So that should be now a now balance equation here. This is so far referred to as a formula equation because I've gone through and I've listed for you all the formulas. Only for a double placement reaction, what I want you to do is I actually want you to check the solubility chart. The solubility chart actually indicates to you which ones are actually soluble and which ones are low soluble. Uh, you have this on your data booklet, so you don't need to memorize it. You're going to check it compound by compound. Start off looking at the negative first, and then mix and match it with the positive. Uh, we're going to find the really top ones are very, very soluble. Uh, you're going to find chlorine with iodine and bromine a couple rows down. When chlorine is bonded with silver or with lead or with copper one, that combination is actually low soluble. Low soluble means it doesn't dissolve very well. We're going to put it in solid. If it says uh, anything else, like in this case here, well, I have calcium with chlorine or I have sodium with chlorine here. 
well, those would belong to the top. In this case here, we actually have soluble. And soluble, we're actually going to put aqueous. So we're going to go through here and we're going to test uh, which ones are aqueous and which ones are solid. Uh, some nice uh, memory aids here. Alkali salts, alkalis, in addition to H+, in addition to ammonium. You have this on your chart here. With any non-metal, these ones here are always soluble. So if I look at this one here, I see that this is an alkali salt, this is an alkali salt. I don't even bother uh, checking those ones. I'm going to say aqueous. The one that's low soluble so far is actually carbonate. Carbonate is actually really low down on our uh, chart here. Carbonate, with the exception of those alkalis and H pluses and whatever, carbonate with anything else is actually low soluble. Carbonate is actually really hard to dissolve. So this one's actually a solid. This is actually what makes up our chalky material. Uh, for a properly worded question, you should see that the first two are actually aqueous. The, on the other side here, you could have both aqueous. In this case here, we have one solid. Because I have a solid that crashes out of solution, we're going to refer to this as a precipitate. 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 And that one, we're going to shorthand that PPT. So in fact, what's happening here is even though the bottle is labeled CaCl2 aqueous, the aqueous means it's actually dissolved. This Ca and the Cl- minus are totally separate from each other. They're just swimming by themselves in a similar fashion. The Na2CO3, they're not holding hands, they're not bonded together. This actually just means you have Na plus ions and CO3 minus 2 ions. The CaCO3, when you pour them together, the Ca and the CO3 end up realizing, hey, we don't dissolve very well. So in this full beaker that I have all four ions together, the CaCO3 actually comes crashing out. That actually has bonded. The NaCl, which looks like it's forming a new compound, because it too is aqueous, just means the Na plus and the Cl minus are just floating around. So just for completeness sake here, what I'm going to do, I'm going to write for you in this example something called a complete or a total ionic equation. We only do this when asked for it. And basically what you're going to do is you're going to dissociate I want you to break up anything that you've labeled as aqueous, but I want you to leave behind anything as solid. Later on, we leave behind what's liquid as well. So when I have calcium chloride as aqueous, that actually means Ca plus 2, 2 chlorides, 2 sodiums, carbonate. Those were all labeled aqueous, so I've dissociated them. The CaCO3 was solid, so I'm going to leave that alone. CaCO3 solid. The NaCl, which is labeled that way, but it is aqueous, this one here is going to be Na plus and Cl minus. You'll notice in this example, even though double placements always make it look like we've created two completely new compounds, wait a second. In this case here, sorry, with the two and the two, I see that we have two sodiums before, we have two sodiums afterwards and two chlorines afterwards. It's like the sodium and the chlorine didn't do anything. So in this case here, we refer to the sodium and the chlorine as spectators. So to get to our net ionic equation. This is getting us a little bit into what we're going to learn in chapter 3. We're going to cancel any spectators, cancel any guys that are the same before and after. In this case here it was the sodium and the chlorine, and therefore our overall reaction is just calcium from my first solution finds the carbonate from my next solution, and they've actually only produced one new compound, which is calcium carbonate. All right? So I'm going to leave it off there for you. You only need to do that detail when asked for it, and it's only for a double placement reaction. Uh, we'll start off a question like this uh, on tomorrow's lesson, and then we'll pick up our review from there. Thanks, guys.